Hi, I'm Connie Jackson, and welcome to Real Talk with the Legends. I am so, so excited to have our guest, Donnie Sellers. <laughs> Donnie, I, I tell you, it's really great to have you here today. And um, you've done so many things. But, I, you know, we could talk about the gold records, platinum records, and all the things you've done in the industry, and we will get to that. But I'd like to start out talking about Camden. You're from Camden. Um, and this is where, I, I like to say, this is where the legends reign. So tell me about Camden and, and how you really began to love music and when that started. Well, <laughs> thank you for having me, first of all. Um, it started years ago. Um, if I have to put a number on it, I guess I cannot start in the 60s. <laughs> okay. But I was a young man, and I was intrigued by people who could play music. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, as I stated earlier, you and I, when we were just talking in general, mm -hmm. um, Leon Huff was the first music artist that I really got a chance to see play. Okay. And I uh, started from there. Okay. Uh, something I didn't mention to you, mm -hmm. um, now that I think about it, it was a group called the Fiestas ah. and a song called So Fine. Oh, yeah. Um, well, Mr. Ingalls, mm -hmm. who was from Camden, okay. um, he joined up with the group while they were in New York. Right. Um, his son, and his name was Teddy Ingalls. Okay. One day they were practicing over at the Bates, and we lived in the manor in the projects. Right. And their house was right outside my back door. Right. Well, the Fiestas were over there practicing. Mm -hmm. And that was the very first time that I got to see a group perform live. Okay. Um, in practice. Okay. And I was intrigued. And that's where it began. I just okay. didn't know it would begin. Well, well, I'm going to take you back a little further than that. Okay. And that's at Hatch Middle School. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so Hatch Middle School, and I went to Hatch Middle School too. But I know you went there before me. But Hatch Middle School, i like you to tell me about that experience with Mr. Mumford at Hatch Middle School. Well, I was looking for something to do. I was walking the hall. And Mr. Mumford noticed that I was acting a darn fool. <laughs> so he said, come over here. <laughs> so I went to him, and he said, can you sing? I said, no. <laughs> he said, well, I'm going to teach you. And he allowed me to join the Glee Club. And that's where it began. Now, you also, you met a lot of people, and, and those, as you said, are you know, icons to this day. But I remember you sharing with me about the first time you heard Leon Huff play in Centerville. Um, because Leon Huff is from Camden as well. So tell me about how you um, heard Leon Huff play in Centerville. Well, being from Centerville, the first thing that we all did as kids was learn how to swim. <laughs> <laughs> and and um, we had the big pool. Mm -hmm. across the street right off of Central Avenue mm -hmm. and there were a row of houses because this was also in the projects in the manor right and Leon was in the pantry mm -hmm. playing the piano for a group called Patty and the Ambrams, mm -hmm. um, which was the first time I saw the group and the first time I saw Leon actually playing the piano right now Leon also played the piano at the pool a lot mm -hmm. of people don't know over top of the swimming pool mm -hmm. on the second floor, right. there was a, a big ballroom, right. which was big back in the early 40s, mm -hmm. I, I believe. I'm, I wasn't around at that time. Right. So, <laughs> uh, but nonetheless, with this big ballroom mm -hmm. that they actually went up there and utilized every now and then. Right. But Leon was playing in the pantry to go back to that. And I, I was standing outside because a bunch of people had gathered mm -hmm. and we were listening and watching him play. Mm -hmm. um, and that was the first time I was introduced, not personally, to right. the group and to Leon. 
Okay. And, and so you said Patty and the Emblems, and, the, and they were the ones I think you told me that did Mixed Up, Shook Up. Right? Mixed Up, Shook Up Girl. That, mixed Up, Shook Up Girl. That is correct. Over you. Okay. All yeah. right. I remember that. I remember that. Uh, that so was that the was first really time. Cool. Mm -hmm. That was really cool. And, I, you know, it, did you ever think at that time that, you know, you would do some of the things that you came to do at that never. time? Never. It was never a thought. Okay. Um, I didn't get this notion to become a music person um, maybe, maybe 10, 15, 20 years after that. Mm -hmm. uh, that's when I got involved. Okay. Um, it was a friend of mine, and I have to mention it because he just recently passed. Mm -hmm. uh, his name was Richard Snooky Jones. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, well, Snooky and I, we, we became friends. Mm -hmm. and. One day we were sitting in this car and he said, hey man, we could do what those guys are doing. <laughs> and I was working for Campbell Soup Company, I have to bring that in. Um, yeah. And I was looking to make a change in my career. Mm -hmm. um, and I think he was working for SEPTA, okay. uh, bus driver. And he was looking to make a change in his career. Mm -hmm. So we decided that we would go over to DAS in Philadelphia. Mm. and. We went over there and started talking to people and telling them what we had an interest in. Right. And somehow or another, it led up to us going into promotions. Okay. Um, okay. And that's what happened. All right. Well, take, take me to Broadway Eddie's, though. Okay. Because Broadway Eddie's, I mean, that was the place here in Camden. That was the record shop. Now, we had several record shops. But Broadway Eddie's was one of the larger record shops where it's right there on the, can, uh, on the corner of uh, Broadway and Mickle. Mm -hmm. And um, I used to go in there. Every day. A lot, right? <laughs> Every <All> right. day. <laughs> Every day. So, so tell me about Broadway Eddie's and, and what you did when you went in there every day. I mean, what was, <laughs> what was the draw? Well, the draw, I was intrigued by all the music mm -hmm. um, and just thumbing through the albums. Uh, okay. As I thumbed through them, you know, you got a chance to see all the artwork, mm -hmm. um, which a lot of people really don't, maybe the younger people today don't know. Um, but there was great artwork on top mm -hmm. of those covers where the music was. Mm -hmm. And as I thumbed through them, I'm looking at the artwork and that became identification. You could identify the music and the artists just right. by looking through the artwork. Mm -hmm. and I used to do that every day, and Broadway Eddie noticed one day. Mm -hmm. He said, man, you, you're always in here looking through these records like that. He said, you ought to be in the music business. <laughs> and it, it was a spark. Right. Uh, and then one day, as I was in there, um, my future boss mm -hmm. came in. I didn't right. know he was my boss at that time, or right. would be. Right. He came into the record store, and Eddie said, look, I want to introduce you to somebody. Mm -hmm. And he introduced me to this gentleman named Richard Salvador. Mm -hmm. And we call him Richie for short. But Richie right. said, you interested in music? Mm -hmm. I said, yeah, I, I want to be one of them record guys. Mm -hmm. So he said, well, come to my office on Monday. This was on a Thursday. Right. He said, come to my office on Monday. Be there at 9 o'clock, right. and we'll talk about it. Mm -hmm. Well, I went there, and mm -hmm. I got there early. I got there a half hour early. And he wasn't there. <laughs> so, so you're thinking, is this guy for real? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that, that was my first thought. Am I being punked? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, when I got there, uh, like I said, he wasn't there. Right. And then maybe five, ten minutes after I had gotten there, he came in. Mm. So he looked at me sitting in the lobby, kind of like saying, mm. what are you doing here? <coughs> Excuse me. I said, what am I doing here? You told right. me to come here. He said, right. I did. I said, yeah. He said, well, what time I tell you? I said, you said 9 o'clock. He said, well, it's only quarter of. <laughs> I said, yeah, I didn't want to be late. So he said, no, come back at 9. <laughs> so, okay. I, I, you know, I really didn't know how to take it at that moment. Right. But 9 o'clock, I went back. And when he opened the door, he bust out laughing because he was punking me then, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but he wound up hiring me, and that was my first gig in the record business. Okay. 
Working and, for and, Schwartz Brothers. And what did he hire you as? As a, as a promotion person. Okay. My job was to uh, get the records played on the radio, mm -hmm. which most people might think is easy, but that's a very difficult job. Right. Because um, you're dealing with a lot of competition. Right. And not only are you dealing with competition, you had to cipher through a lot of records. Mm -hmm. um, to find out which one was compatible to that radio station. So, so what was the process? You, you know, you had to get these records played and you had to interface with, I guess, the, the record uh, industry, the, you know, the top, top folk who would determine whether or not they're going to play these records. I mean, who were they and what was the process? What did you have to do? Well, for most promotion people, it's to get it heard. That's step right. one. Right. Whoever could listen or whoever would listen mm -hmm. was your audience. Mm -hmm. And that's what you wanted. And right. you wanted that because you needed the encouragement. Right. You needed the encouragement from just the average Joe Schmo, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, listening to a song, say, hey, man, I like that. Mm -hmm. Well, that was invigorating. And you took that and you took it to the next step, which was the DJs of right. all the radio stations. Mm -hmm. You try to get them involved. Right. Um, and then from the DJ, you would go to the music director. Mm -hmm. And from the music director to the program director. Mm -hmm. And try to go through the whole process of getting the records played. Sure. So now, you know, uh, we're going to talk about the artists in, in a moment. But oftentimes you'd hear payoli. <laughs> you know, that you'd have to pay folk to get your record played, you have to pay the, the DJs or, you, or, or you know, whoever's playing the record. I mean, did you, have you ever experienced that whole um, issue and piece of payoli? No, I've never experienced it personally. Okay. Now, as to whether or not it existed, I truly can't answer that question. Okay. Um, but from my point of view and the things that I had to deal with, that was never an issue. Mm -hmm. um, the people that I dealt with, the DJs, the music directors, program directors, it was all for the love of the music. Mm -hmm. um, had nothing to do with money. Um, right. You know, they would listen to a song mm -hmm. and they would make a determination as to whether or not this was a song that they could play. Right. Um, and fortunately, my career and the careers of those people that I'm speaking on in, in the music business, they all made it their business to do it the right way. Right. And that was the right way. Right. I'd never had any involvement in payola. Right, right. So, so, that, so, so now this industry, this industry, would you say that this industry is dominated by white males? Um, um, in, in this interest industry, oftentimes, you know, you, you, you kind of see um, those who, individuals who don't really look like us. Well, that's in the high, hierarchy of the industry, I'll say. During my time, Mm -hmm. um, the early 70s, throughout the 80s, mm -hmm. um, most of the 90s, I'd say yes. Um, it was dealt with by mostly white males. Mm -hmm. um, that's on the higher end. Right. Um, now, I'm, I'm sure each one of those companies had people that they dealt with on, on another level. Mm -hmm. But on my level, yes, mm -hmm. because it was so much more than just the music. Right. See, uh, again, most people don't know, and I, I'm not taking anything away from them. They just don't know that it was a business. Mm -hmm. You know, the music business was a business. Mm -hmm. And I mean a business in every aspect. Mm -hmm. um, there was nothing done in the industry mm -hmm. that wasn't calculated. Right. Um, meaning they had departments that dealt specifically with whatever it is that they had to deal with. Mm -hmm. um, most people don't know about the marketing department mm -hmm. or the merchandising department mm -hmm. or the sales department. I mean, each one of these places were businesses right. and they all were set up as a business mm -hmm. and we all came together, which made a conglomerate. Right. Um, and that's how the labels became what they were. Right. Now tell me some of the labels that you've worked with and you did some A&R stuff as well right only from so. a perspective of a record promoter okay um the a and r was a department okay you had people who 
gave their life for that. I mean, that's, oh, wow. that's what they did. Right. You know, they, they found groups and artists and mm. went on and, and helped them become who they become. Right. Um, me as an A&R only became after they did what they done. Okay. Um, I was more like a confirmant. Okay. You know, I, I said, yes, this is a hit. Okay. Now they have already did everything that needed to be done. Mm -hmm. I was just the bottom line okay. to say, yeah, I think I can get displayed over the airwaves. Mm -hmm. And that's where we became A&R people. Okay. Mm -hmm. So tell me um, about some of the gold and platinum records that you have, like um, Janet Jackson <laughs> and Sting. <laughs> yes. And, you know, uh -huh. tell me about that. I mean, tell me about Janet Jackson. Let's talk about Janet Jackson. Well. I started working with Janet when she was 12. Wow. <laughs> yeah, most people wouldn't know that. 12. 12. <laughs> she had just, she had done an album. Right. Um, I can't remember the name of the album, but mm. I think the title was called Janet. Okay. That was the album. It right. was just titled Janet. Yeah. And she was in the swimming pool. Here we mm. go back to swimming. <laughs> <laughs> she was in the swimming pool. Right. Um, and she had this orchid on the side of her hair, mm -hmm. and she was 12 years old. Wow. And I can't remember the name of the single, mm -hmm. but we, we worked it, and mm -hmm. I worked it as a, an independent at the time. I was right. not a representative of that record company. Okay. I was an independent right. who saw the album and thought I could help. Right. And I was trying to promote it, and that became one of the first ones that I worked with was Janet. Okay. Now, of course, uh, the next one that she did mm -hmm. was the Control album. Ah, she yeah. was no longer 12, she was 21. Wow. <laughs> and uh, that album lasted from, I think we started working that in 1984 or mm -hmm. 85. Right. And we worked that album mm -hmm. until 1989. Wow. And then okay. in 1990, she came out with Rhythm Nation. Oh, yeah. So yeah, rhythm, rhythm Nation was huge. Oh, uh, <laughs> and Control actually, she sold about 10 million copies of that wow. record. Um, wow. But it started out, we, we didn't know exactly what was going on. And when right. I say we, I'm talking about the whole structure. Sure. Um, we didn't know exactly what was going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, but it started with Miss You Much. Oh yeah. Um, I wanna miss you much. Uh, yes. Hey. Uh, <laughs> and then it, it went on and it kept going and kept going and right. next thing we know we had six number one singles out wow. of that album. Number one. Num <laughs> <laughs> number number one. Number two doesn't count. <laughs> number, number two one. doesn't mean the same. <laughs> <laughs> um, only when you're going down. Right. <laughs> uh, yeah. But coming up, uh, number two was not an issue. Okay. You had to go from wherever you were in the numbers game mm. to number one. Right. Um, and if you didn't do that, you didn't do your job. Right. So, yeah. That, that awesome. was Awesome. So you got, was that a platinum record that um, you have? Yeah, that's a platinum. Okay. Um, and then once you get the platinum, it becomes double platinum, triple wow. platinum, wow. quadruple platinum, wow. you know, and keeps going. Each, each million that right. you sell. Right. And I believe we sold 10 million copies. Wow. On, on that particular wow. album. And then you had you did Sting. Yeah, right? um, a very interesting guy. I was fortunate enough to be with him. We were walking, <laughs> he and I, we were walking the streets of New York City mm -hmm. and we were on our way to a radio station called WBLS oh, in yeah. New York. Yeah, yeah, BLS, um, yeah. So we, he was going to do an interview at the radio station. Right. And as we were walking, <laughs> He made reference to one of the songs mm -hmm. uh, that was on that album, right. and the name of that song was "An Englishman in New York." Mm. <laughs> so, okay. um, just something I had to throw out there because right. he's an Englishman, right. and we were in New York, <laughs> so it was all How all ironic. good. <laughs> How ironic! But it was all good. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. And Sting is—he's um, the artist of artists, um, right? Very down to earth. Mm. Um, very much into his craft, right? And uh, it was a pleasure working with him. Awesome. Now tell me about Barry White. <laughs> well, <laughs> the first time I met him, mm -hmm. he came into the office, and 
I said something crazy to him. I, I don't know what it was. Right. I, I, something like, who's this big guy? <laughs> you know? <laughs> it was, this big come, dude. Yeah, coming into my office, I have no, yeah. who's this guy? <laughs> right, right. Knowing that I knew who it was, right, but right. He, he caught up with the joke. Mm -hmm. And we became friends. Right. Uh, and that day he said, I, he pointed at me, said, you right. can no longer call me Barry White. Mm -hmm. And I looked at him and I, I was a little taken back right. because I didn't know how serious he was. Right. Um, he said, you can call me BW. Mm. And wow. that became how our friendship grew. Okay. Yeah, he became okay. BW and on and on from there. Okay. And okay. I, I have to tell this story. Right. We were at um, one of our music conventions mm -hmm. in Atlanta, Georgia. Right. And it was the biggest music convention that we, as an industry, mm -hmm. had. Right. And it's, it was called Jack the Rapper. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, if, if you That's weren't huge. a part of Jack the Rapper, then right. you truly wasn't a part of the record industry. Right. Well, <clears throat> I'm at the convention, and this array of people standing mm -hmm. behind the red rope. Mm -hmm. You know, they got it roped off. Right. As the red carpet comes into to the, I think it was at the Marriott Hotel, okay. where we were having the convention that year, mm -hmm. and as people will pull up in their limos, etc., almost like the Oscars, I guess, right. pull up in their limos, get out, and mm -hmm. come strolling down the red carpet. Sure. Well, Barry pulled up, mm -hmm. or BW, pulled <laughs> up, and um, he's walking down the red carpet. Right. And I'm standing there amongst all these people. Right. How he saw me, I truly do not know. Right. But as he's walking up the red carpet, he looks up and he saw me standing there and right. he, he came through the red rope, the velvet rope. Right. And gave me this big hug, <laughs> pulled me out, <laughs> gave me this big bear hug right. and said, Donnie, my brother. Wow. Um, and for me, was a moment of my life. Right. Um, just to have him acknowledge me in, in this sea of people. I mean, sure. I, I'm talking about the sea of people. Oh, yeah. And for him to pick me out right. and give me that hug in front of all these people was right. just the utmost. Awesome. Yeah, that's what it was to awesome. me. Very awesome. awesome. Well, you've done so many things. And, uh, you know, I, when I saw all the gold and platinum records that you had, I was like, wow. And this is Camden being represented. Um, has anyone ever told you that you look like uh, somebody from the Whispers? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have. To. Have they ever told you that? <laughs> yes, I, I've been told that by a few people, um, including the Whispers themselves. Okay. Um, <laughs> there was Scotty uh, and Walter. Mm -hmm. Well, one day we were over at DAS. Uh, right. WDAS right. Um, and Butterball. Mm -hmm. We were sitting in Butterball's office. Right. I was right. and Butter and a couple other people. Right. When this guy named um, Jack Wellman, mm -hmm. rest his soul, um, he worked for Capitol Records at that time. Right. He's coming in with the whispers. Mm -hmm. So as they're coming in, <laughs> um, they pointed at me. The right. whispers. This is Walter and Scotty. Right. They pointed at me and I started smiling because they were on Capitol Records then. Right. But when I first met them, they were working for RCA. They right. were on Solar Records, okay. which was distributed by RCA. Okay. And I worked for RCA, so I worked all those records before and they remembered who I was. Right. So I wasn't the record promoter. Right. Again, this guy named Snooky Jones that I had mentioned before. Right. He was a record promoter, mm -hmm. but because I worked for RCA, I was also a promoter. Okay. So they came into Butter's office, <laughs> and we're hugging, and most people didn't know who were in the office right. that we knew each other that way. Right. So they hung, Donnie, Donnie, and I'm saying, yo, <laughs> and, and we're hugging. <laughs> so when they would started to leave after they did their interview with Butter, right. um, one of them said, man, did anybody ever tell you that you could be one of the whispers? <laughs> and then Scotty and Walter turned around right. and said, y'all didn't know? He's the sixth whisper. <laughs> so 
from that moment on, I became an honorary six whisper. Wow. And I mean, even to this day, right. when they see me, right. they remember that entire episode wow. and say, yeah, he's a six whisper. Right. So, <laughs> that's the truth. Wow. That, that is awesome. That is awesome. Well, you know, um, I am just so happy, honored that you could share this time um, to be able to just, you know, tell us some of your history, your journey, and um, just happy to know that you're here to tell it because so many individuals are, are, have just either um, passed on, uh, gone on, that's not here to actually tell their story. And so I'm glad that you could be here to tell us your story, tell us about your journey, and to share some of those things so that some of the younger folk you know, can really know about what it is that uh, you came through and that individuals came through um, years and years ago. Now everything is digital, whereas then you, you really had real albums and, and CDs and things like that that you don't have today. Um, that's historical and the business has changed so much. You, you really, it really was hands-on. So, I mean, we know that you, you and the work that you've done have paved the way for so many. And so we'd like to, you know, give honor where honor is due. So thank you for paving the way for so many of these young artists that are out here today that don't even know. Um, so, Donnie? Well, <laughs> in, in close, <laughs> I'd like to say thank you. Um, for allowing me to speak uh, and tell parts of my story. Um, to have been in the music industry was such a deep pleasure. Mm -hmm. And I may not phrase that correctly, mm -hmm. but for me it's correct. Mm -hmm. It was a deep pleasure being a part of the industry. Um, I have to give props to all the fine folks at WDAS. Mm -hmm. Um, and I only choose that one radio station because it's so close to here at home, Camden. Sure. Um, and I guess I'd be rem remiss if I didn't mention WHAT mm -hmm. and Power 99 and, mm -hmm. and all those radio stations right. who supported me in helping make some of the music that I was able to promote. Mm -hmm. Some of the finest music that we can reach back and listen to. Sure. Um, I thank all those people. Mm -hmm. um, there are some who moved on, the Tony Browns of the world, right. uh, um, the Cody Anderson, who was the general manager of yeah. WDAS, mm -hmm. um, Butter. Um, mm -hmm. I, and I mention them because not only were they a part of what I did, they're a part of me as well. Right. Um, they're family. Sure. And I love them all. And I just, Thank you again for mm -hmm. allowing me to be able to, to exercise that thought. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Mm -hmm. And so we will see you again. Um, just great having uh, Donnie Sellers here. And we'll see you again um, talking with the legends here in the city of Camden. This is where it started, right here in Camden. Yes. RCA. <laughs> yes. Um, There's one other thing started. Sure. before you close out. Sure. Um, there was a radio station here in Camden. That's right. Um, WCAM. WCAM yeah. Camden. B yeah. And then right after that, it became WSSJ. That's right. Um, which was Gary Shepard. Yes. And Patty Jackson. Yes. Um, a lot of people don't know that Patty had a start right here in Camden. Yeah. Um, yeah. Gary came from Detroit, if I remember correctly. Okay. And he started SSJ here in mm -hmm. Camden. Uh, I don't know what happened or what became of the radio station, sure. but nonetheless, I just, I couldn't do an interview like this without mentioning. Yeah. Um, I, I met Jerry Blavitt uh, at CAM. Yeah. Uh, Jerry Blavitt. And Kay Williams. Okay. Um, the legendary Kay Williams. Yes. Uh, he, he allowed me to come into the studio and sit with him years ago, mm -hmm. and that's when I had an interest in being in radio. So. Right. Uh, I thought I had to bring that up. Oh no, I'm glad. I'm glad you did. WCAM. I mean, that's they had the Camden School scene. They had. I mean, you know, there's just all kinds of things that individuals that they really wanted to get into radio. 
that was the place where you could do that. And uh, when I was in high school, I was there with Leon Benson. Okay. Um, on WCAM, Camden School Scene. But yes, I, I often say Camden is really where it started. This right here is the music mecca. So we're just glad that we could be here and still talk about it. We will see you and um, thank you for joining. Connie Jackson, myself, yours truly, um, Real Talk.